Now, before we get started, today, I was, as I was in prayer and I was just waiting upon the Lord, um, about a month ago, um, God was really dealing with me on trusting him. And um, I really feel like this is a word for somebody, and he gave it to me, so I'm just going to give it to you as he gave it to me. Um, I was back in the back of our property. We have 38 acres out here, and um, we have a campground for those who might not know. And I was back there working on one of the buildings on the roof, and I just been, God had been dealing with me on trusting him. And I looked up in the tree, and when I looked up in the tree, I just noticed that there was this leaf that had not fell yet. All the other leaves had fell, you know, this is that we're coming out of winter, and all the leaves had already fell, all these strong winds had blown, but this one little leaf was still holding on. And I just remember as I stood there and looked at that leaf, the Lord just put it in my heart. He just said, you're holding on like that leaf, and you need to let go and trust me. And at the time, I really didn't think much about it. I was like, okay, Lord, I know I need to trust you. But as I went home that night and I started thinking about it, I realized that um, that leaf should be able just to let go and fall on the ground because right now that leaf has already did everything it can do and it's dead. It's did the ministry that God has called it to do and it's done. So now the next ministry that God wants it to go to is to fall to the ground so it can enrich the soil to bless that tree to grow more and bless other things that's growing out of the ground. And we're the same way sometimes. We're holding on to God and we're holding on to that part of ministry that he's asked us to let go of and we need to just let go of that so we can fall into that place of ministry that he's called us to now. And there's a lot of people that are still holding on to the past because that's where they're comfortable and that's where they're, it's familiar to them. And God's telling you tonight that you need to let go so he can let you fall into that place where you'll be more effective for him. There's a place where you're more effective right now than you've ever been before because he's groomed you and he's grown you up. And you're still holding on because you're not trusting God. And I just want to say tonight, trust God, let go of that, and let it fall into the place he has you. Amen. And I don't know who that's for. It might be for a multitude of people, but I just thank you for letting me share that tonight. All right, moving on. So tonight, trusting God through all things. Now, as I was praying and getting ready for this message, um, Elijah came to my heart and my mind. And I started thinking about um, how Elijah actually... <laughs> did not trust God fully. Even though he did all these mighty miracles and miraculous signs and wonders came from him, he actually had a trust problem with God at one point. And the Bible says in James chapter 5, verse 17, that we have a nature like him. What does that mean? His nature is like ours. That means that we have the same characteristics and the same basic form and things that go on with our life, the same thing that goes on with him. So just because he did all these signs and wonders, that's who God chose. We are all the same. There's no difference with us. God shows no favoritism or partiality. With God, everybody is equal. Elijah was just another man like us, but God chose to use him to bring his glory forth. So tonight I want to go to 1 Kings chapter 18, and we're going to start at verse 17 through 19. If you guys could all turn over with me, please. Thank you, Lord. We just praise you tonight, Father God. Again, Father God, I just want to thank you for your word coming forth tonight, Father God. I want to thank you for blessing this word tonight, Father God. We honor your word tonight and give it first place in our life in Jesus' name. Okay, in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17, I want to start there. Now, what I want to do is I want to give you a little background of what, what he went through and the miracles he did right before he decided not to trust God anymore. Okay, because I want you to see that all these things happened in one day, or at least in the word, it says, it doesn't say that there was a day skip between here as I read it. So here we go. Verse 17. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord. You have followed the Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Ashtoreth, who eat at Jezebel's table. Now, Jezebel had set up all these false prophets, and um, there had just been a drought called upon the land. Actually, um, Elijah did it. And it was probably in about 
three and a half years had passed, so um, since the drought had, been, um, had happened. And now it goes on to say, I want to go to verse 25. We're going to skip through so I can get to the meat of what I'm trying to talk about. And remember, through this whole thing, I have not digressed, but I'm just giving, laying down a foundation so we can build on that. And you guys can see that even Elijah f- stumbled and had troubles trusting God. Now, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal. From morning even till noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. And this is great right here. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud, and they cut themselves. And I want to stop right there for a second and let you know that cutting yourself is a sin. If you would notice right here, I believe that this is the first time it ever talked about people cutting themselves. And if you noticed... These people was cutting themselves with lances. So um, maybe teenagers, if you're listening to this tonight, I just want to let you know that it's a sin to cut yourself because you're messing up that temple that God made. That's not the way to go. And it goes on to say, they cut themselves as was their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. Okay. Now, so let's go on. We're going to continue through this. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me. Now listen to this. Elijah had heard from God. He said, I have did all these things according to your word. So Elijah had been taking time and he prayed and he heard exactly what God wanted him to do before he did this. Okay, so is everybody following me? All right. I have done all these things at your word, verse 37. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. He executed them there. 450 prophets, false prophets. And it goes on in verse 40, 41 to say, this is all together. See, it doesn't say there was a day between them or nothing. It just continues. So this was all in one day. All these things happened. Then Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for is this, there is the sound of the abundance of rain. Now go to verse 46. I'm just going to skip through here real quick because I'm trying to get all this laid out so you guys can see all these things that happen verse 46 then the hand of the lord after elijah had went up and prayed he prayed seven times and then the rain came okay so he's down they're getting ready to take off ahab had already took off it says ahab rode away and went to jezreel and then verse 46 says this then the hand of the lord came upon elijah and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of ahab to the entrance of jezreel Ahab was on horses. Elijah was running on foot. He outran the horses. He actually, they had a head start, so he outran them and passed them. That's the power of God right there. (laughs) So this is the second miracle that happened. Actually, the third miracle that happened in one day. He had just killed 450 prophets. He prayed for rain, which ended a a three-and-a-half-year drought. And he outran a horse. Now let's go to um, verse 19, 1 through 4. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. 
also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as one of the life of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die and said, Is it not enough? Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Now, I just want to say something right now. Elijah had just did three of the, some of the biggest miracles in the Bible. I think it was huge that he outran a horse. It's like in a cartoon when you see the guys and their legs go real fast. That's probably how fast his legs was going. You couldn't even see them. You know how they go, zoo, zoo. I mean, that's just amazing. But he had just did all these miracles. And Jezebel just sends a servant to say that to him. And it scares him to death. And then what happened to the trust that he had in God? After he himself had just performed these three miracles, and when she says, I'm going to make your life as one of those prophets, he got in fear. He got all whopper jawed and messed up and out of alignment, and he got in fear. I like to use whopper jaw because um, there's an um, old timer out here on the grounds, and um, sometimes it, that's the first time I ever heard that was when he said whopper jaw. And I just said one day, he, he said, Wha- that's whopper jaw. And I was like, what? I was like, what are you talking about? He says, you know, that's whopper jaw. And I was like, what do you mean? He says, whopper jaw is when something's out of a line. It's like when stuff's not lining up that should be straight and lining up. <laughs> So, and I just want to let you guys know something also today. God's not moved by a virus. God's not moved by a virus. He's not moved by nothing. But I just want to share that with you today, that he is not moved by a virus. Now let's go to, um, I want to finish this up so I can get into here and uh, tell you guys what all this is, what all is going on. Let's go to verse 9 through 18. Here we go. This is, everything is culminated to this point. This is where I wanted to get to, and this is what I really want to preach on right here. And I appreciate you for sticking with me. And there he went into a cave, verse 9, and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? (laughs) Now, I want to go back up. I'm sorry. I want to go back up to verse 8 and share something with you guys. Before he got to the cave, it says this. After, you see, he, um, he left and went one day's journey into the wilderness. Outside, why couldn't that have been enough? He sat underneath that broom tree and wanted to die, but why couldn't that have been far enough? Why couldn't he have just stopped there and prayed? See, I don't understand that. He must have really been fearful because he could have stopped there and prayed and said, okay, Lord, what's up? What do I need to do? But he got so full of fear from Jezebel That he wasn't even thinking about that. He was just thinking about getting as far as way as he can. Now, I don't know about some of you guys, but I don't want you to get so afraid of this virus that's going around that it causes you to do all these crazy things and not do what God's called you to do and causes you to get out of the will of God and causes you to fall away because you're not in the same routine that you're used to being in. We need to get back in alignment with God and centered where everything's lining back up again. A lot of us, I know that this virus has threw a lot of people off and we're out of our comfort zone. Our kids are at home, but you got to find that time to get with the Lord. Through all this, we got to find that time where we get quiet before the Lord and listen to him. Even if it's at night when all the kids are asleep or first thing in the morning, five o'clock in the morning when everybody's still asleep. Sometimes I like to get up like that and go into my living room and turn on the light. And sometimes I fall asleep, but sometimes I just pray and I read my Bible. And sometimes those are some of the most precious times you can have with the Lord. He meets you at those times. I mean, because you're setting that apart and you're saying, okay, Lord, let's talk. Those are precious times, and that's what the Lord wants. Let me continue on here. Okay. Verse, I want to go back to verse 8. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in that strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. So when he got to the cave, he had went 40 more days into the wilderness. He was really afraid. I don't even know what he was thinking. 
<laughs> so let's go on. I'm going to go ahead and start back with verse 9. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? The Lord said, What are you doing, man? See, the Lord sometimes has a sense of humor because an angel came and fed him so he could keep going for 40 days. So the Lord just let him go. Sometimes the Lord just lets us go and do our own thing because we think we're smarter than the Lord or we think that we can do it ourselves. And then we start trying to do God's job. Instead of stopping and regrouping and going back to that place where everything happened, we just take off and try to do our own thing. Elijah was like, well, I'm just going to go do my own thing. And you know what? The Lord let him because the Lord's a perfect gentleman, a perfect gentleman. And he, you can't, if he's not going to stop you, I mean, he's going to let you do what you want. Uh, and if he would have prayed, he could have saved all that time. Because you see, in those 40 days and 40 nights, I wonder how hot it was. And I wonder how hard it was for Elijah. He hadn't packed a bag or nothing. He just had the clothes on his back. Man, I bet you he was stinky. Anyway, I'm sure he stopped at a stream somewhere and took a bath or something, washed his clothes. But can you imagine 40 days and 40 nights in the desert? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so the Lord has a sense of humor because he said, he said this again. Let's go right back there. Okay. So he said, he, said, um, he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Verse 10. So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. I want to let you guys know something again. He said it right here out of his own mouth. I alone am left. And here in a minute, you're going to find out he wasn't the only one left, but he thought he was. So there he went thinking again. I don't have nobody to help me. Nobody's here to protect me. He thought that God didn't have a plan. He thought that his plan was better. <laughs> I mean, so that's just, that's the bottom line right there. So let's, let's continue on. Um, verse 11, he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped himself, he wrapped his face in his mantle. And he went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly, a voice came to him and said, Again, what are you doing here, Elijah? I think when the Lord said that to him, he was trying to make him think about what he did and what had just happened, well, what happened 40 days ago, 41 days ago. And he was trying to get him to think about that and realize that he was running in fear. And there's something I want to ask you tonight. What are you doing here? What happened? What caused you to get in fear and take off and just get all whopper jawed and out of alignment with God? It goes on to say, verse 14, and he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, go, return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. Now listen, what the Lord's getting ready to tell him, he could have told him when he was a day's journey out of the city instead of 40 days away. He went through all those hard times. He had to go through all that stuff. And you know, when you're out of the Lord's will, nothing works. Everything messes up, stuff breaks down, you're out of peace, you can't focus right, you get angry at things, or at least when I go through things or I get out of the Lord's will, that's what happens to me. I don't know about everybody else, but that's what happens to me. So 40 days, we've probably been going through this virus for 40 days now or more. I don't know the exact days, it's kind of all mashing together now. But 
Have you been struggling with having peace? Have you been struggling with things because you've gotten out of the will of God a little bit? It don't take much to get out of the will of God, but you know when you're out because things just do not work. But when you're in God's perfect will, things work. Like um, Elijah was in God's will when he um, killed the prophets of Baal, when he prayed for rain that hadn't been on the land for three and a half years, and when he outran a horse. He was in God's will. Things aren't working. I want to ask you to step back and pray and look at your situation and see if you're out of God's will. Okay, verse 16. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to go ahead and start back with verse 15. Then the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elijah, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Maholah, I hope I got that right, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So um, Elijah thought he was the only one left, and he thought he was doing God a favor when he killed all the, um, the prophets. But he actually still had 7,000 left and reserved that Elijah didn't even know about. And I think if he just would have stopped and prayed a little more instead of getting all freaked out, God would have told him all this sooner. If you've been going through some things, I wish that you maybe would have came to the God sooner. But now's as good a time as any. Because I can tell you what, when I get out of peace, that's one of the worst things. I hate losing my peace. I found that when I'm in the peace of God, that is always the best place you can be. So stay in that peace of God. All right. Now, there's a few other things I had wrote down here I just want to share with you tonight. Uh, don't, don't let this time we're in throw you out of whack. God didn't tell you to figure it out. That's his job. Our job is to pray and believe, not pray and do. We're to pray and believe. We are to pray, listen for that still small voice, because that's where the answer is. Then do what he said. Quit doing God's job. <laughs> You're just, you'll just mess it up. God can do something in the blink of an eye. What could take us years to do or even never get done, God can do like that. So whatever you're in right now, if you just would pray, because you know something? That's never, downtime is never wasted time. You know what? The only time it's a wasted time is if you don't utilize it. If you don't use it, then it's wasted time. If you're sitting on Netflix all day long and getting aggravated at the kids and screaming out, get outside, and it's, you're, they're out there freezing because it's so cold, because you can't handle them no more. I mean, come on. <laughs> Let's get in with, back in with God where we need to be and get realigned up and get back focused and do what he's called us to do. Because even though you're at home and you have this downtime, I was looking through my notes today from a long time ago, and I came across this, and I believe that this is for somebody. I know I keep saying these things, but there is something I wrote down that I, just, I really need to share that's been on my heart since earlier. I just found this earlier when I was going through some things. Listen to this. This is about waiting for the Lord. Because sometimes... My problem is I used to hate, hate's a harsh word, I used to totally dislike waiting on the Lord. I always wanted to run out ahead of God. I always wanted to take off and go. He'd give me one word, and I wouldn't wait to listen to the rest of it. I was like Elijah. I ain't going to lie. It's a sin to lie anyway. I was just like Elijah. God would give me one word. Instead of listening to the rest of it, I would hear that one word, and I would shoot out ahead of God. And then I would mess things up. Now, I know sometimes a lot of people don't even go and pray, or they've prayed and they've got one thing. There, there's one other thing in here before I read this that I want to um, share with you that God put on my heart also as well. For a day in the wilderness. Just give me one second to go through my notes here. It is right, okay, right here. <laughs> okay, listen to this. Sometimes halfway through our miracle or the work we're doing for the Lord, something happens. Money runs low, help runs out, 
Symptoms try to return. We're all in the middle of something right now. And instead of stopping and regrouping and getting refocused on Jesus, we freak out. Oh no, this is it. We act like the Israelites. God brought us out here in the wilderness to die. We try to figure it out and we do God and to do and we do God's job instead of taking our authority and praying again and saying, "All right, God, you brought us this far. What do I do next?" We just stop believing in God when one little thing happens. When the devil throws one little monkey wrench in our plans or in our in our whatever's going on. Like I said, maybe symptoms when you got healed of something, they start returning. What do you need to do? You need to rebuke it and tell it to go in Jesus' name. What about money running out? Maybe a pastor started to build a church and the funds are starting to dry up. Well, hey, if you heard God and he told you to do it, do it. The money will come. In Jesus' name, that money will come because God always takes care of what he calls you to do. He will always bring the money. He'll bring the people to help you. You just keep going forward and keep your eyes focused on God, and he will take care of it. But don't quit. You can't quit. He didn't quit on you. He carried that cross all the way to be hung on it, and not one time did he quit. He could have when he fell on that road and he was beat up and carrying his own cross after he was beat up and, you know, he was marred beyond recognition. You could not even recognize him. And he still carried that cross because you know why? He's seen your face the whole way there. And he said, I can't quit because of them, because of you. Don't quit on God. He's not going to quit on you. All right, I just want to read this real quick. This is about waiting upon the Lord. While we are waiting upon God, he is working within us miracles for his glory, which we cannot observe or describe you may think that you are not making progress. You may feel like you have waited too long and time is wasting. But often you are moving fastest with God while you're waiting in secret. You are approaching the goal that cannot be gained by speed as you wait upon the Lord. We're all, we all have to wait upon the Lord right now. If you're at home and you've been called to stay at home. But let's not let this time get away from us. Let's let God do something in us during this time. You know why? So that when he does talk to you and tell you what to do, if you get into his word and you start praying, when he tells you what to do, you will hear him more clearly and you'll know it's him. Because the Bible says, my sheep hear my voice and another they will not follow. And I just want to encourage everybody tonight, under the sound of my voice, I just want to encourage you to keep pressing forward. This virus will be over soon, and we'll be getting back to the way things was. But I don't want you to get back to the way things was, because maybe the way things was was not good. But in this time right now, you have precious time. Time is a precious commodity. Time, you can never get time back. You can never get time back. Take this time that you have because you may never have time like this again. Life gets busy. Kids get busy. Things happen. You get grandkids. You get kids. You get birthdays. You get events. You're always gone doing something. But right now you have a time when you can focus on God. I pray that you would take advantage of this time and use it to draw closer to him and let him do a miracle in your life and change you into his image. Let's pray. Father God, I know, Father God, that this was not what everybody was expecting at this time that we have. But Lord God, I pray right now that we would take this time and that you would make good out of this time that we're in, Father God. That our hearts would be drawn back to the one true God. That our hearts would be drawn back to you, Father God. That we would take that time to read the word to read the word to our kids, to have everybody get together and have a, a Bible study in our houses. Let's just not do schoolwork or stay on the internet or stay on Netflix. Let's take this time 
and have a Bible study with our kids. Let's take this time and re-strengthen our family unit. Let's re-strengthen those relationships that's kind of been lost after all of our busy lives because we're so busy, Lord God, and sometimes things get overlooked. Kids get overlooked. Relationships get overlooked because we get so busy with life. Lord God, help us take this time and make good out of this time and strengthen our families and our relationships that once was so strong. Help us to get back to that place, Father God. I thank you for this time, Father God. And I pray that this time would not be in vain, but it'd be a time we can use to draw back closer to you, Father God. I love you and thank you for this word tonight, Father God. I pray for each and every believer under the sound of my voice tonight, Father God. And if you're not a believer, I pray that you would ask the Lord into your heart. But I pray right now, Father God, that you would just continue to bless, watch over, and protect them. I plead the blood of Jesus over each and every person in our family, Father God, of believers here at this church, in our church in Indianapolis. I pray the Psalm 91 over them, Father God. And I thank you for our families that they're safe, protected, and taken care of, Father God. We give you the glory and give you the praise. In the name of your precious son, Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody said, amen. Thank you, and God bless you.